Okay, so once again, welcome and happy Halloween. Glad we could all come in costumes tonight. Uh, and I trust that you weathered the, uh, the storm and I hope it wasn't um, too difficult. Uh, I know some lost power, not as many as in other times and in other parts of the East Coast. And just to acknowledge those who have suffered, um, there have been some significant loss of life and, and uh, a lot of other suffering as well of, of property and people, a lot of hardship and just kind of holding all who are going through difficulties in, in, in our hearts this evening. Um, the, um, the theme of, uh, of the talk tonight is um, finding peace amid storms and elections, <laughs> insights of the Buddha and neuroscience. So what I want to talk about this evening, uh, ways in which the Buddha spoke of 2,500 years ago about how we can work with whatever it is that's coming up. You know, I don't think they had a lot of elections in his day, but they certainly had storms and other trials and tribulations. And, and this practice is, um, is appropriate and highly beneficial for working with whatever the joys and the sorrows and the pains and the pleasures are that, um, that arise. Um, just a quick check-in. Did um, do any of you feel that you um, kind of were, were stressed out or anxious about around the storm and where it might lead or might, where it might, how it might unfold? Any anybody experience that? Yeah, everyone. Um, anybody feel that you took in a lot of information, kind of? watching TV or listening to radio, like, where, what's, where's it coming, is it coming here, what's going on over there? And my own experience was, I mean, I don't tend to get kind of overly, you know, kind of worried or freaked out, but my, one of my um, causes of, sometimes it can cause anxiety, is I tend to kind of take in a lot of information and so what I found myself up the day after the storm feeling kind of really quite tight and negative and, you know, kind of funky, not feeling good and, you know, mind state didn't feel very positive. I didn't feel I have a lot of energy to do things or kind of a lot of aspiration. And I paid attention to it and I realized that I really had watched too much TV and kind of got really caught up in the information and some level of anxiety that comes out of that when people, oh, what's going to happen? Look what's happening here. So one of the things that I did was I just took like 15 minutes and I lay down and I just kind of relaxed and, you know, it was, if, I, if I'd have gone to sleep, that would have been okay, but it was kind of in between state. But what, what I was able to do was just kind of recalibrate the nervous system, just kind of almost like rebooting the computer, you know, kind of, and that was really, really helpful. And it's a way... Um, you know, that's just one way in which this practice of just, firstly, we have to be aware that there's something amiss. You know, in the Buddha's teaching is the first noble truth, the truth of suffering. We have to recognize that there's something, that there's suffering or stress before we even feel interested or inclined to do anything about it. So really helpful, this practice of awareness, say, oh, I'm feeling tight, I'm feeling tense. I mean, maybe right now, some of us may still have some residue from that. Um, you know, the other big thing that's going on um, right now, some of you might have noticed, is there's an election going on. <laughs> Six days or whatever away. And um, does anyone feel that you're you're watching more TV or radio, listening to more radio than you, um, than you maybe would feel is help, helpful or healthy. Any of you here feel, I'm not gonna get into the content, so don't be nervous about kind of like, oh, <laughs> is he gonna say you should vote this or that? <laughs> Obviously not gonna do that, but 
more just kind of the way in which we can involve ourselves in the conditions of the world. Do any of you find yourself worried or anxious about how they might turn out? Like, you know, oh, if this candidate wins or this party wins, what are the next four years going to be like? Do does anyone find you're taking in too much information and getting stressed out by that? Seems like some... Um, who feels like you're you're listening to or watching people, only those people who you agree with. <laughs> we, you know, it's one of the things right now that, you know, um, we, tend to, um, we tend to kind of listen and watch and read the things that somehow reinforce our, our own opinions. I mean, I know that's the case um, with me, you know, and it's something I bring awareness to, but you know, something like, I don't agree with that position, I'm, I'm less likely to uh, kind of read it or listen to it. Um, does anyone find yourself getting angry or, or um, judgmental towards those who have different views from you? Maybe a candidate that you disagree with or some an opinion, per, you know, a pundit or whatever you disagree with. So, who said no to all of those? <laughs> Maybe one or two people. But we, you know, it's one of these areas where we tend to, we can get really sucked in. And if the answer is yes to any of these questions, then it's really a good signal that bringing mindfulness to how you're engaging in this process might be a very helpful thing. Might, be, might help ease stress and suffering. I'm not suggesting to be disengaged or, or to not be interested, because that can be just another form of aversion, you know, of like, oh, you switch off altogether. Personally, I think it's very, a very good thing to care about, how our, about our world and to care about the, you know, the political process and about policies and decisions that affect all our lives. But we can get involved in these things and everything else in ways that, um, that are not helpful to us, uh, that are not, not healthy for us, for us. The political process, elections, storms, um, other events, um, are really areas to bring awareness to and explore how am I holding this? What's my relationship to what's, what's happening? Um, whatever the circumstances or the conditions are, you know, whatever's going on, whatever our experience is, we have the capacity to choose between peace and suffering, between happiness and well-being on one side, and stress or anxiety on the other side. That poem that, um, that I read during the meditation, or quoted in the meditation from Dorothy Hunt, peace is this moment without judgment, this moment in the heart space where everything that is, is welcome. It's this understanding that in each moment we can choose peace, happiness, or freedom, or we can choose stress, anxiety, suffering. We don't often acknowledge that, or even necessarily realize that it's a choice. But insofar as we're caught up in our views and opinions, the things that we want, the things that we don't want, we are in fact making a choice. Each time we act out a habit, even though we don't necessarily examine it, then we're, we're actually making a choice. We, the choice really is, in any moment, is being aware or being unaware. And if we're aware, that's really a gateway to happiness, to peace, to freedom. And if we're unaware, then it's really a gateway to continued stress and suffering. I think realizing this possibility, realizing that we do have a choice in every moment of our lives, is one of the most important 
steps on the spiritual path. Because if we don't have that realization, then there's not really an understanding that, that freedom is essentially within our own hands, in our own hands, it's, it, that happiness is in, in our hands. And that's one of the great realizations of the Buddha's teachings, that we actually can choose whether to, to be happy, to be peaceful, to be free, or to choose suffering, stress, anxiety, unhappiness. The latter we don't think of as choosing, but it is actually, as I said, it is actually a choice. It's kind of a default choice. If we're not being present, we're being somewhere else. So really, this step, this choice is really a simple shift from being identified with our experience, being caught up in it on one hand, or being aware of it on the other. A shift from automatic or habitual responses to experience, or to actually being aware of experience. So here's, it's really the choice or the difference between being caught up in a strong emotion. Let's say we're caught up in anger. And we get identified with a story in our own mind. How could he do that? How could she say that? Um, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. And we're actually kind of swept up in it. You know, a, a kind of an extreme example of this would be road rage where somebody is so caught up in their anger that they, you know, they, that they do something really violent and, and kind of act out the rage. So just being caught up in a strong emotion or a strong mind state on one hand, and on the other, being aware of the energy of the emotion, bringing attention, bringing awareness to the thoughts that are present and the bodily experiences that are present. But having enough space to step back from it. This is one of the most important distinctions in the world. Because once, if we're caught up, then we're just acting things out over and over again. We're acting out habits, we're acting out patterns, we're acting out conditions. But with awareness, whatever the energy is, whatever the emotion is, if we can bring awareness to it, then we're already on the path to freedom freedom from that emotion, freedom from that mind state, because we're not, no longer caught up in it. I think of it, an, an image that I find helpful is like of being riding a wild horse. You know, when we're riding a wild horse, where do we go? Well, we go wherever the wild horse goes. There's a kind of the story of somebody galloping past on, on, you know, on a horse and somebody shouts out, where are you going? And the rider says, don't ask me, ask the horse. And this is really kind of when we're swept away, when we're carried away by a strong emotion or mind state. It's like we're carried by that energy. We're no longer, as it were, in the driver's seat. The horse, the energy is in the driver's seat. Um, the difference between this and the difference between riding a horse where we're, you know, the horse is trained, where it's going essentially where we want it to go. We can, you know, hop pull the reins and it goes to the right or goes to the left. This is really, the, this is the essence of the Buddha's teachings, that we can cultivate and develop peace, happiness, freedom, and that we can find a way out of stress and suffering that our freedom, our peace of mind, comes from and really depends on training our mind. This is really kind of the core of the Buddha's teachings, that we can train our minds. Here's a quote from the Buddha. I know of no other single thing so conducive to misery as this uncultivated, untrained mind. I know of no other single thing so conducive to well-being as this cultivated and well-trained mind. 
So the difference between a trained mind and an untrained mind is the difference be between freedom and suffering. All of the harm and the violence that we see around us and we see in history really comes from an untrained mind, untrained minds. It comes from people acting out, you know, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I'm believing, and therefore I've got to do this. You know, it, out of that we turn people into enemies, you know, there's killing and there's violence, there's greed, because there's not awareness. There's not awareness of our own experience, there's not awareness of our interconnectedness with others, there's not awareness of this whole web of life that we've got caught up in a very limited partial view, an illusion essentially, and then anything is possible. As the Buddha says, with an untrained mind anything is possible. All the harm and all the suffering in the world um, can come from a mind that's not trained. So the great realization of the Buddha is that we all have the capacity to live a completely free life. You know, this sometimes it's called the Buddha, our Buddha nature. This capacity that each one of us has, not just an elite, not just kind of special people, not just the Buddha, but each one of us has this capacity to wake up to be free of suffering. The great Thai teacher, Arjun Chah, of, lived in the kind of the 20th century, um, late 20th century, he said, if you let go a little, you'll find a little peace. If you let go a lot, you'll find a lot of peace. If you let go completely, you'll experience complete peace, complete freedom. Your struggle with the world will be at an end. I like that last line. Because so much of our lives, you know, we experience as like a, a struggle with the world. Kind of get things the way we want them to, get rid of the things we don't like, get more of the things we like. It seems like you have a field going through life that kind of feels like a struggle. A struggle with the world, the struggle with other people, struggle with other situations. And yet there's this capacity to live a free life. And we can you know, we don't necessarily all have to believe that we're going to become Buddhas in this lifetime, but I think all of us are here, all of us are, you know, on, have taken some steps on this path, or spiritual path, because we see some level of freedom is possible, or greater freedom, less stress, less suffering in our lives is possible. So, the Buddha taught there is a path of training, of practice, to help us find freedom from suffering. So in, what's really been interesting in the last, particularly the last 20 or 30 years, is that increasingly studies in neuroscience, studies of our brains, um, Philip Moffat, who would have been here, he talks about it as the coconut, the coconut, studies of the coconut, of our brains, and how they've evolved and how they operate, are coming now to very similar understandings about the fact that we can train our, our minds, that we can change, actually change our brains, physically change our brains, um, and I'll talk about that this evening, and that we can find, experience much greater freedom and peace in our lives. There is this kind of convergence, or kind of the, the Buddhist teachings have been saying it for 2,500 years, but these, the studies, the scientific studies of, of the brain, the nervous system, um, are coming to very, very similar um, understandings, very similar conclusions. And I'll talk about that, um, those this evening. That we can train our minds, that we can change our brains, and that this Training can lessen stress and anxiety and can increase happiness and well-being. Here's how um, a wonderful current Tibetan teacher, Minga Rinpoche, put it. I love this quote. He says, ultimately happiness comes down to choosing between the discomfort of becoming aware of your mental afflictions and the discomfort of being ruled by them. I'll read that again. Ultimately, happiness comes down to choosing between two kinds of discomfort. The discomfort of becoming aware of your mental afflictions and the discomfort of being ruled by them. 
And that's really the difference I was talking about before. It's uncomfortable when we're ruled by our mental afflictions, when we're carried away by our anger or our judgments or our aversions. That's uncomfortable. It's experienced as stress and suffering. It's in the Pali language, dukkha or suffering, when we're caught up in that. But there's that suffering. And then there's the discomfort of being aware of them. It's still uncomfortable because we're bringing awareness to something that's unpleasant and difficult. But the difference is that the first one, just, we just keep acting out the habits over and over again, and there's no release from the suffering. But with the second, when we bring awareness to the afflictive states, there's a way out of the suffering. We actually come to see that we don't have to be trapped in it or caught up in it, that it's actually an impermanent experience. It's a selfless experience. If we don't cling, if we don't hold on, everything comes and goes. And there's a way out of suffering. It's a tremendously important realization on this path to see that however strong the emotions are, the mind states are, the afflictive states are, that if we can bring awareness to them, we can find freedom from them, and within them. Eckhart Tolle says, everything we accept, we go beyond. Everything we accept, we go beyond. And that's why we talk, you know, a great deal, you know, in the meditation instructions and in the talks about welcoming. Tara Brach talks about radical acceptance, the name of the book. Radically, deeply accepting what is here, accepting this moment as it is. Another spiritual teacher, Byron Katie, uses the phrase of one of her books, loving what is. Loving what is. Opening to our experience as it is. You know, we don't have to like what is, but loving what is is really welcoming, opening to, accepting this moment as it is. So in, in Minga Rinpa, the quote from the Tibetan teacher, Minga Rinpoche, um, he uses the word choosing, choosing between the two kinds of discomfort. And I think the word choosing is important because we often don't take our state of mind as a choice or how we meet our state of mind or emotions as a choice, but more as a given. It's just how it is. And we kind of act it out quite often. But in any moment, as I've said, in any experience, we can choose to meet this, emo this moment with awareness or with lack of awareness. And the former will lead to happiness and to well-being, and the latter will lead to continued stress and suffering. So in any moment, we can ask, how am I choosing to meet this moment? This one right now. You know, just aware of, as you're sitting here, as you're listening, as I'm speaking, I kind of feel, oh, tightness in my belly and in my chest, just kind of feeling, oh, nice to be here. And uh, whatever you're feeling is what's here. And the, and the choice is, how am I meeting this moment? What am I aware of? And can I be with this moment as it is? Am I opening to this experience and accepting it, saying yes to the truth of this moment? Or am I in some way resisting, checking out, kind of, uh, you know, identifying, with it. Here's how the Buddha under, understood the mind and its capacity for freedom. This, he spoke about the mind being luminous. He said, luminous is this mind, brightly shining, but it is colored by the attachments that visit it. This unlearned people, people who are not practicing, do not really understand, and so they don't cultivate the mind. Luminous is this mind, brightly shining, and it's free from the attachments that visit it. This, the noble follower of the way, really understands. So for them, there is cultivation of the mind. So these kind of two alternatives the Buddha often gives. The first is that in each case, the mind is spacious, open, free. But in the first case, there isn't, the mind isn't trained. And so 
we get caught up in attachments. We see things that aren't really the way they are, but we identify with them. It's like an image I have of somebody who's on a journey and trying to get somewhere, and really with their eye on the prize of where they're going. But all along the way, people are shaking shiny objects and gold baubles and saying, no, try this, come over here. This is much more interesting. This is, don't, don't forget about your journey. You know, enjoy this. And we get caught up in these attachments. We get caught up in these, th these illusions, really. We think this is going to provide, oh, if I only have more of this, if I only have this kind of security, or oh, if I only had a relationship, or if only I had more money, or if only this difficult person were out of my life, or if only I had a different president. You know, I mean, all of this kind of wanting things to be other than they, they are. Um, when we're caught up in that, we're, we're, as Tara would talk about, we're taking false refuge. And we're forgetting about the true refuge, which is in awareness, which is in our, in our basic being present with, with what is. So the Buddha's path of training is a path to freedom from suffering called the Noble Eightfold Path, and it includes you know, training in cultivating, living wisely, living compassionately, training the mind to see things as they really are, and, and cultivating wisdom. And a key element of this path that we talk about a great deal is the practice of mindfulness. Mindfulness really is the way, you know, the, the way out of suffering. If we can bring awareness to what's present in the body, to whatever emotions are present, whatever mind states are present, whatever thoughts are present, just a non-judging awareness, a kind and compassionate awareness to our experience as it is, then what arises naturally is insight, awareness, that is liberating, that allows us to, to see that nothing can be held on to, and that we, when we try to hold on to anything, when we grasp, when we cling, then we suffer. So the Buddha taught that freedom is really not dependent on the conditions of our life. We might have really difficult or painful conditions, but much more dependent on how we meet those conditions, how we meet the circumstances of our lives. Um, great... Um, quote from uh, Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning, where he says, um, you know, talking about even in the concentration camps, um, it, could, it was possible to, that he said, they could take everything from us, but the last of the human freedoms, the freedom to determine how we respond to our conditions. They couldn't, they could take everything else away, but not that freedom the freedom of how we meet our experience. And that's really the essence of the Buddha's teachings too, that our happiness and our peace depends on how we choose to meet with whatever conditions, external conditions, the things that happen to us, the joys and the sorrows, the losses, the happiness, all of the, what the Taoists call the 10,000 joys and 10,000 so sor 10, sorrows, how we meet those, that experience. That's what determines our happiness and our well-being. So I want to talk for a few minutes, or kind of focus in the rest of the t talk, on what the science is showing and how that is meeting together with these, um, these ancient wisdom teachings um, of the Buddha and other traditions as well that, that are pointing to the same truths. That our freedom and our happiness is in our own hands. So the, 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 sci the studies of the brain, the neuroscience, is confirming the Buddha's understandings of the mind and the capacity we have to, to train the mind and to, in fact, change our brains. One of the understandings that have come in the last 30 years or so is that our brains change throughout our lives. And what we do and how we use our attention can bring about important changes 
in our brains. This is called, as you probably know, neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity, that is the, the kind of the changeability, the malleability of these brains. It used to be thought that once we reached adulthood, the brain was essentially kind of stopped there. It developed during childhood, adolescence, but then it stopped. But the studies have found that with the brain is changing throughout our lives. There have been some really interesting studies of how the brain, our brains change with the activities we engage in. So they've done studies of London taxi drivers. You know, they have to learn the mazes of, I think, 30,000 streets in London in order to pass an exam and train, study for three years. And they've found that the London cab drivers' brains are thicker in areas that are key to visual spatial memory. So those, that part of the brain gets highly developed through the activity of learning, okay, this is the Brompton Road and this is how you get to uh, the Bayswater Road or whatever it is. Also, they've studied musicians, the brains of pianists are thicker in areas of fine motor functions. You know, imagine a pianist or a violinist and how the activities of, of the hand and um, how the brains are changed through the the, the training in fi fine motor functions. They found that the brains of meditators are thicker in regions engaged with sensory awareness and control of attention. 